1035, waiting room open. <laughs> Admit all. There we go. Joining, 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 joining. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Everyone's on mute. Unmute yourselves. It's so good to see everyone. Likewise, you, Christina. Xenos. Hi, Robert. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good, good morning. 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 If you want to, I'm going to mute everybody later, but if you want to talk now, say hello. You know, hey, hey everybody. Hey, a lot of us, a lot of us in today's session know each other quite well and haven't seen each other for better than a year. So yes. uh, <laughs> let's, let's take a few minutes to chat, shall we? Oh, that's, Saturday. that's very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question. Oh. I have a question. I have a question for Robert. Do you have any idea when we can go back uh, to <clears throat> meeting and seeing each other again? Um, we are looking to 2022, unfortunately. We're being very cautious as a company. As we supply across the United States, we're taking every precaution and not going to get ahead of ourselves. So um, unfortunately, it, it's not going to happen until 2022. So bear with us with these online events. They're very educational and very convenient. As you can see here, I am at my uh, cabin, kitchen and dining room, uh, reporting from you li live today, so. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sitting here in my dining room in uh, Historic West Adams. And, uh, you know, as you can see, it's art, Arts and Crafts of Palooza. But it's, you know, the, these are, you know, the, these are the places in life where we're most comfortable. And it's great to be able to work for them from them if you know if you're uh, if you can get your whole if you can get your soul around it as I like to say. <laughs> Robert, where's your cabin? Oh, I have a cabin up in the mountains. For those who are familiar with uh, the Sequoia National Park area, I'm in the Sequoia Monument. That's wow. amazing. Ooh, if nice. I'm not. If I'm not talking produce, which that's the only way you guys know me, I am fishing. I am a big trout fisherman. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. So. Well, I have to say this works really well for me. I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. Very good. All right. We got some, we got some East Coast representation here. Nice. <laughs> Athens, Georgia. Athens, Georgia. Awesome. Yeah, give us some shout outs here. Nice. <laughs> Yes, I'm glad to be here joining in from Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Very good. Hey, we've got the Northwest represented. <laughs> good to see you, Kesar. That is that is one of the see great you. that's one of the great benefits of one of the great uh, silver linings, if you will, of this is the connectivity. Um, you know, we have a we have a, yeah, a, a, a database. I'm on a program. <laughs> <laughs> we have a database of about thirty eight thousand. And it's global, About it's about three quarters US and the balance is global. Um, when we were doing nothing but in-person events, we were limited to Southern California. And if they were spirited events, we were really limited to, you know, more local LA because people aren't gonna drive, you know, like that after drinking. Right. But um, since, we, since we introduced the virtual events, um, you know, we're getting people from all over the country and, and now and then some international. Although with the time differences, that's 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 still a challenge. So um, anyway, yeah. So it's great. Yeah. So if uh, yeah, uh, anyone else from 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 farther flung places outside of SoCal who hasn't already identified him or herself, Lander, Wyoming. Wyoming. Wow. Okay. I love to go fishing up there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's snowing today, though. <laughs> All right. Then. Oh, Jeez. gosh. It is not snowing here. <laughs> no, even in the mountains, it's like 65, 70 and pure sunny skies Yeah, in the Sequoia National yeah, yeah. Mo Monument area. Yeah. Sorry, Wyoming. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Uh, okay, we're going to start in just a minute or two. We're still waiting for um, um, people to uh, in the meeting admit. 
just admitting people as they join us. Ah. <clears throat> Oh, there's Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hello, Carrie. Hi, how are you? Adam oh. just got on too. Or as I like saying, or as I like saying to Carrie, hello, hon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he didn't hear me. He's still connecting. He's connecting. <laughs> <laughs> really good to see all of you. And I appreciate all of your cooking even more than before. That would be Jerry's disembodied voice. Hi, hey, Jerry. Hello, Jerry. Hi, I was just saying that I really have been cooking more than for three husbands and 22 years on the show. And I really appreciate your, you guys work so much more now. And you can do the cooking. I still would like the eating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, we are going to start now. Um, uh, Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I think uh, I know most of you know me and I know most of you, those who I don't. Uh, uh, welcome to the Center for Culinary Culture. My name is Philip Dobard. I'm president of the center. Uh, with us today is Mr. Robert Schuller. Robert is director of public relations at Melissa's and World Variety Produce um, in the great city of Vernon, California. Um, um, a, uh, a very a very special place Melissa's is. Uh, um, Robert uh, has been uh, successfully working to cultivate um, a culinary community um, uh, around uh, what Melissa's does. And I must I have to say, being being a member of that community, uh, it is a very very uh, uh, special space. So. There you go. Um, um, this series, uh, many of you know our work. Uh, we tell the story of food and drink through exhibits, which we haven't been able to do in the past year. Uh, In-person educational programming, which again, we haven't been able to do in the past year. And a range of media. In fact, the pandemic, um, the great silver lining for us is that we've spawned a media division, Eats, Drinks, TV. In fact, there's Christina Xenos right in the middle of my screen there, star of Complete Greek, one of our, one of our now seven or eight and expanding series. Um, so, um, and, and of course, these virtual programs. So um, thank you all for joining our community and uh, look forward to seeing our newsletter if you haven't received it already. And we hope to see you again at, uh, at some of our many, many, many events. Um, Robert Schiller. Robert was introduced, Robert and I were introduced, I don't know, about three years ago now by the late, great Ernest Miller. Um, and um, we joined the Melissa's community and it's been to, to my personal and our corporate great benefit. Um, Robert is many things, uh, but uh, it is, it is, his capacity today is produce expert. And uh, those of you who have been witness to his produce demos in the past know that you were in for a treat because it's, 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 it's quite the show. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna interview Robert for a few minutes and then he's gonna go in to talk about Spring's Edible Bounty. Uh, we started doing these quarterly demo series a couple of years ago, and they're very special because we're able to showcase what's in season with each season. And, you know, the fact is fall and winter, for instance, are just as bountiful. Uh, you just have to know what to look for. So, Robert, welcome to Morning Call. Thank you, Philip, for having me. and glad to be a part of this, even though it's online. I do miss our in-person event there, um, you know, uh, it looks like 2022 seems to be what looks to be the time in which things are gonna be in person, but we're just dealing with what we have in the meanwhile. Uh, I'm happy to be back here today and been uh, supplying uh, the Center for Culinary Culture uh, for years now uh, with the many food guests that they've had on. So thank you for having me, Philip. Glad to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, 
So Robert, tell us tell us a bit about about yourself. Like, uh, where did you grow up? Uh, how did you come to find yourself leading a life in and committing yourself to a life in produce? Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, I've lived in uh, Southern California all my life. Actually, in San Pedro, California, coastal community. I grew up surfing. Um, went to Cal State Long Beach. Got my did degree anybody, in marketing. Any, there are a lot of people here who know Robert. Did you know that he grew up surfing? No. no. Exactly. Really? Okay. All right. Oh, New information. I think, most people, I think most people think that all I've lived my whole life is in produce, which I have for 25, uh, almost 25 years. I've worked at Melissa's Produce. I'm the voice of Melissa's. I wear, I wear many titles. My, my formal title is Director of Public Relations. Basically, I spend my whole day talking to the media and getting them excited about produce. Melissa's Produce, who I represent, is the largest provider of uh, produ uh, variety produce in the United States. We're also the largest organic supplier in the United States as well. We have a product line, hold on to your seats here, over 1,500 different produce items that are available to us throughout the year. Today in our warehouse, we have over 950 items that are in season. As you know, we're heading into spring and that's what our show is gonna be all about. But getting back to uh, my humble beginnings, I, uh, I uh, was a local person in Southern California. I went to Cal State Long Beach, got my degree in marketing. Um, I, I decided uh, when I got to my senior year that there was just a few industries that I'm really interested in. But what most, uh, what most of us, I probably agree with me, who because who, many of my foodie friends are on today, what draws us to the food industry is the love for food, uh, cooking food, trying new foods. So when I uh, found a little tiny ad for Mark, assistant marketing director at this uh, Melissa's Produce, I was intrigued. Uh, you know, I thought for sure I'd probably go in the beverage industry because I was, I love wine and beer and all that stuff, or probably meat because I love barbecuing. But little did I know the, uh, how much I didn't know about produce. Back then, 25 years ago, I think I only knew about 15 or 20 produce items. I was uh, brought into the company on an interview um, from my good friend and associate family member to the Melissa's family, Deborah Cohen, who uh, interviewed me and took me through our th 300, well, it's now 300,000 square foot um, facility in Los Angeles. And as I was going through and looking at all the produce, I, I said, I never, I've never seen that in my life. I've never seen that in my life. And I knew that I knew a lot about beverages and cooking meat, but this whole realm of learning about produce was so new to me and it attracted me immediately um, to take a position with the company. I got an offer within a week um, and uh, took it and I, I, haven't, I haven't looked back. And so um, it, I'm excited to be a part of a, a, a company that um, provides one flavor to health. And you know, who want, as a cook, and I assume everybody's a cook at home, uh, who doesn't want to share the excitement bounty? Because I don't think there's like 15 different types of meats or 15 different types of cheeses. Maybe there are, but to know that there's all these different varieties of produce available to the marketplace, I knew I'd find my niche in that. And now um, coming, actually, Philip, coming up uh, um, in May of 2021 uh, here. Um, we'll be we'll be introducing my seventh cookbook that will be out um, uh, with Melissa. So you wow. know you acquire a lot of knowledge over the years, and you just write cookbooks. Yeah, talk to us about your your authorship. You have you have uh, you have uh, you have quite the uh, literary CV. Well, uh, it started in 2006, where our company, uh, the owners Joe and Sharon Hernandez, who started the company. Uh, just over 36 years ago. So Joe and Sharon Hernandez are still active, not only as owner, CEO, and president, but when the company was started, uh, nine months, literally nine months later, 
Melissa was born, their only daughter, their only child. And that's how our brand name came about. And so we're now now in the marketplace 36 years later as Melissa's produce. Okay, so you're like the Wendy's of produce companies. But is Wendy's actually a person I, or a fictitious person? I think it's a real person. Oh, okay. Uh, but you know, I could be wrong. You know more about that world than I do. Um, yeah, she's a real person. She's a real person. She is. I thought so. Um, tell us about the, um, uh, there's a bit of a, a, a branding question. Tell us about the distinction between Melissa's and World Variety. Okay, so when our company was founded uh, just over 36 years ago, um, the, the, the package actually said World Variety Produce on it. It's a very long and very corporate title. You'll find it on the backs of all of our packages, World Variety Produce. So you can say that's the parent company. Okay. But we have two brands. 92% of our brand is Melissa's Produce in the marketplace. You'll see the, um, the Melissa's logo on our packages that are packaged and not bulk. Um, our other brand name, if you didn't know, is Don Enrique. Don Enrique is a line of uh, our Latin dried items. Who's Don Enrique? Don Enrique is the grandfather of Joe Hernandez, owner and president of Melissa's Produce. So the brand names came about because they're short, they're easy, they have meaning. It's it's a family. It's a, still a family-owned company. Uh, there's over 50 uh, family members that work actively at Melissa's, including Joe, Sharon, and Melissa too. Okay. Uh, over the time you've been there, the 25 years, how has the the Melissa's portfolio in terms of items, uh, because you're 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 the you're the 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 country's leading the leading distributor of specialty produce, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. How has um, the portfolio grown? Well, first of all, we've really grown as uh, as a company. When I first started 24 years ago, we had almost a thousand items. I think for the last 10 years, I've said we've had over 1,500 items, but I'm sure it's a lot more than that now. 15 is just a good round number. Um, and uh, our, at, when I was hired on, um, there was only two people in the marketing department, me and Deborah Cohen. Well, our marketing department is now like 15 people. So we've in-housed a lot of our stuff. So that just goes to show just not only in my department alone, but uh, our company uh, has six tupled the amount of size and also distribution. We currently uh, import in from about 45 different countries. So when produce is not grown domestically, it's not in season, we look to below the equator to find it in season. So for example, as you know, peaches are available from May until about uh, October here in the United States, and then the season disappears. However, you think to yourself, well, I see peaches in the stores from uh, late November, December through about February. That's because they're coming from Chile. So we'll go to places throughout the world to find where it is in season because there is consumer demand here in the United States. I can tell you for being in the United States, we are most blessed for our farmer's markets, and for our produce departments to be able to offer so many produce items um, in a local store produce department. So everybody's very fortunate. Other countries, not so fortunate. Uh, we import and export just as much as any other company. And that allows us to um, offer so many different varieties. But our main growing area here in the United States, as we get into the spring and summer months, we are high reliant on the Sun Belt states. California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, because unlike our person who's in Wyoming, you can't grow anything in Wyoming when it's snowing and you know, you're know you under a freeze in Wyoming six, seven months out of the year. So I'm sure the person who's on us today from Wyoming is looking forward to the next month or two when everything thaws out and farmer's markets and your stores become more filled with bounties of produce. Yeah. Um, I know that, that Melissa's uh, uh, distributes and ships all over the country. Um, is LA your only distribution center? That is correct. 
We only have one uh, area throughout the United States, um, and that is in the city of Vernon, which is, uh, if you're familiar with uh, South Los Angeles, um, it is the logistical hub for produce in the United States. Um, from our facility, we are 20 minutes from uh, the uh, seaport, LA Harbor. We're 15 minutes from LAX, a major air. We are the center point for Union Station for rail. Um, and, and because California is, one of, is the major producer of fruits and vegetables to the United States, um, we are in a logistical hub, which makes sense. Um, you know, who knows, maybe in the future you might find, we might have a Melissa's on the East Coast. But as we stand right now, all our quality uh, is goes through uh, single, single doors at Melissa's. Mm -hmm. And uh, that keeps our quality as we are in the marketplace for not only uh, flavor, taste, but overall quality of our products. Wonderful, thank you. Um, before we, Robert has put together, has curated quite a collection of uh, Springs Bounty uh, for, for today's show and tell. Uh, but before we do that, um, you, you might have seen in our promotional copy that there will be a, a lucky winner among today's registrants um, or today's attendees, I should say, um, uh, of uh, the, the Del Monte Pink Glow Pineapple, courtesy Melissa's Produce. And that's one of the things uh, Robert's going Robert's gonna to showcase today. Where's the top? <laughs> I pre-cutted everything so you don't see me cut throughout yeah. the whole show. But All I'm going to do a lot of show and tell today. All good. So we're not going to select one winner. We're going to select three winners. So three lucky uh, individuals uh, with us today uh, um, uh, will receive uh, uh, via UPS um, um, uh, one of those uh, pink glow pineapples. Uh, but the winners will be chosen uh, um, out of a, a, a social media contest. Uh, and I'm gonna enter in the chat um, what the Instagram handles and hashtags are. Uh, we're gonna keep this open. We'd like you to post about today's event and uh, how wonderful or awful it was. Um, uh, I'm just joking about the awful. Um, uh, and this will be open until noon Monday noon on Monday. And then uh, those lucky three will have a pineapple show up on their porch. So uh, I can attest, uh, they are delicious. They are indeed very pink. And uh, the presentation box is, whoever thought a pineapple would come at a presentation box, the box is spectacular packaging. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna, we're, we're, I'm gonna post that again. Um, there they are at Eat Drink CCC, at Melissa's Produce, and a couple of hashtags: Morning Call and Eat Drinks TV. Eat Drinks TV. Um, so, Robert, I'm going to hand the floor. I'm going to uh, hand the floor over to you and spotlight you. And uh, people, we are going to have a a uh, a free for all Q and A at the end. But if you'd like to, if you'd like to pose any questions along the way please feel free to enter those in the chat. I will be monitoring uh, the chat for incoming. All right, Robert, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, uh, tuning in today. Uh, today's topic is the best of spring produce uh, in the United States. And so I hope uh, you either have your computer or a piece of paper and pencil, jot some notes down because we're gonna super drive your next uh, uh, visit to the produce department or your local farmer's market. And uh, you're gonna feed your family some of the best tasting fruits and vegetables during this time. So spring is actually an awkward time naturally here in the United States. I mean, as, we, we, uh, as you know, if you're in Southern California, which many of you are, we're in beautiful weather, California, especially Southern California, the Central Valley, uh, has warm, sunny weather. Sorry, uh, Seattle or, or uh, DC or Wyoming who might be getting some snow showers today. You're gonna have to wait a few more weeks. That's the awkward time because, you know, it's not a abrupt transition from uh, cooler temperatures into warmer temperatures. You know, sometimes, you know, when the, when the, um, the, the um, 
we have an extended uh, winter and we get cooler temperatures even in the spring. So your local farmers markets might not have a showing until about May or June. But if you lived in sunny Southern California, as we know, we're known for our farmers market. There's a farmers market every day somewhere in Southern California that you can go to. But okay, so let us begin. Uh, this is how we're gonna upgrade your meals during the <laughs> springtime and tell you what is the best of the best in spring produce right now. First of all, I'm holding in my hand, uh, probably the best tasting fruit that you'll have. Um, it does look like a tangerine, but it's, there's a specific kind. It's called the pixie tangerine, the Ojai pixie tangerines. This is a late season tangerines. As you see many tangerines uh, that are plentiful from late November, um, and then about March, most of them kind of start disappearing. There's only a few selections. Well, in March is when these pixie tangerines start. And what makes these pixie tangerines, it's really all about the flavor. They are just so easy to peel. They're seedless and they're super sweet. They brick so high on a refractometer and they're consistent with flavor and taste um, from March all the way through at least late May. Sometimes we have them until about mid-June. This year was a bumper crop, so I would say we definitely have them through June. They're grown in Ojai, California. For those who don't know where Ojai is, it, um, it's about 10 miles inland from the Ventura um, Beach City County there. And um, just uh, what makes these um, fruits so unique is that this is the main growing area for all of the United States. And it's so interesting because the Ojai Pixie Tangerines they grow in a microclimate. Their, um, their mountain ranges go east to west versus north to south. So because of the mountain ranges in that area, that <laughs> valley gets sun from eight o'clock into the morning until about 7 p.m. at night when the sun goes down. And they, the, the tangerines thrive on that sunlight, which makes them so flavorful. If you ever go to Ojai, California, it is a resort town. But if you go there right now during the peak of the pixie tangerine season, um, you can get a, they put pixie tangerines in everything, chocolates, teas, coffees. Uh, a couple of the places actually have a pixie tangerine massage. So that is a great place to go in the springtime. Um, Ojai, California for these delicious pixie tangerines. So I hope that's number one on your list. Next up, I think most of the United States uh, knows that strawberries are very, are very, um, um, they always, people always look forward to the springtime because that's when you start to see strawberries really occur. If you live in California, like many of us on the line here, strawberries are year round um, because most of them are grown in, in California, Ventura, Oxnard, all the way down the coast and whatnot. Um, but what I'm holding in my hand are these organic strawberries called Harry's Berry strawberries. This is a grower out of the Ventura County area that we've aligned to. These are the best of the best in strawberries. No, not all strawberries taste the same. This particular grower, Harry's Berries, um, only grows organic varieties. And they're, they're, the, uh, they're the only ones that grow the Camarosa and the, ski, the Seascape variety. And this is the last organic grower, a commercial grower, in the United States that grows them and has them available from March until about May, June, until it starts getting a little bit too warm in that growing area. But as many of you know that are tuned in, remember how we used to get those strawberries and the green punnins and they would just be dripping. And by the time you got them home, you probably ate most of them because they're so delicious. This is that same variety. Harry's Berries is the only one that still grows those strawberries, but they're not in abundant. They're in the clamshell. And um, this is the thing. When you eat, typically cut open a strawberry, they're much larger than these. These are, these are, all these Harry's Berries are very small, like the ones you used to remember. But size doesn't mean flavor. When you cut these open, they're going to be not only red on the outside, but red on the inside. And that's the flavor that makes them so special. Yes, you'll pay a little bit more for them at the store, but they're well worth it and look for them. Again, they're organic Harry's Berry strawberries 
And they're my second favorite spring produce at this time. Robert, are there other varieties or is, there, or is it just the seascape? We have a question. The seascape and the Camarosa. Okay. Camarosa. Those are the two varieties that are available from March until about May, June, until it starts getting a little warm. Okay. So um, I'm sure you can get buy the seeds online, uh, but uh, for those who can grow them at this time, this is a great time to um, now um, grow them in your in your garden there. I'm sorry for those who live in sun in, in snow bound areas, you're not as lucky to grow some of these varieties as we are in Southern California where they're grown. Okay, next up, melons. Now, you probably, um, you're probably disappointed with melons during the winter months. Um, that is because they're not abundant, they're picked early in the season, they're imported, and they don't, they don't have a lot of flavor to them. So usually during the winter and springtime, people don't buy a lot of melons. Usually the only two that you have available uh, are honeydews and cantaloupes. And maybe if you're lucky, you might see a watermelon, but it's just not that season for melons. However, in the last few years, Melissa has been distributing this variety. For those who have been to France, you're probably very familiar with this variety. It is called the Charente. This is the, this is the France cantaloupe. This is the everyday. They grow them year round um, in France, Italy, and a lot of European countries. As you know, um, it's smaller in size. It's personal in size. So you can actually eat it yourself or share it with your loved one. Um, but it really comes down to flavor. These are not grown into, in California where most melon varieties start up in May-ish and go through about September. And that's when melons taste their best. However, the Charente is available year round. So right now during the springtime, this is the melon you wanna buy. Looks like a cantaloupe on the inside, but it is delicious. And I know a couple of you are shaking your heads. There's you really nothing quite like it. Ones. And it's no, very dramatic, it's dripping into your hand. Those are so juicy and so, so rich. Yeah, I know. Philip's saying that because uh, it seems like he orders the Charente melons for uh, Eat Drink uh, show and many of his guests who come on because I'm always supplying him produce for him and Chef Tracy uh, who are doing that segment there. So, uh, um, quite, Robert, we have a, a quick question. Can you explain sure. refractometry? Oh, okay. So to measure the BRICS level, the BRICS level is sugar the sugar level. content mm -hmm. on on a drip of juice from uh, any produce item. Mainly it's done on fruit because you want your fruit to be sweet. Um, so it doesn't taste like, you know, like a cucumber, you know, like many melons taste during the winter time. You, um, too bad I didn't, I didn't have one with me, but a refractometer is a tool of the trade in the produce industry and the agricultural industry. It looks like a little telescope and you drip a little juice on the end and you look through it in a reading, kind of like a mercury reading, but it's not a mercury reading, but it will show a measurement of a sweetness level. Mm -hmm. um, most bricks fruit have to be above an eight, but for like tangerines, like the pixie tangerines, these bricks, the sweetness level is at a 21, which is high for tangerine. The strawberries, they break somewhere between an 18 and a 20. That's really sweet. The, the Sharon K. Melon, these bricks really high. These bricks at a 22. So if you like your sweet fruit, um, um, look for a fruit that's high in the bricks. And quick, quick, our quick. company, Melissa's, br constantly bricks is with a refractometer to measure that sweetness content. You'll not necessarily see in the stores. Quick question about the uh, jackfruit pods. Uh, and the BRICS level there, if you know it. Um, I, I, share, I share a house with someone who is, who is uh, following, uh, pursuing a keto diet at the moment. And she mm -hmm. loves jackfruit pods, uh, but she, she uh, this morning I, I had some with breakfast and she, she wanted some and she looked at the carb, the carb level, the carbs in a single serving, it said I think at 33 or 35. Um, mm -hmm. So is the BRICS level particularly high? with uh with jackfruit pods do you know 
Extremely. And then, thank you, uh, Philip. I was going to just do a segue into the jackfruit. Very good. The, um, jackfruit is a very large fruit. I didn't bring one with me. It would fit larger than this screen. They get up to 100 pounds. It's been a big food trend in produce departments across the, uh, uh, across the uh, whole United States because the jackfruit is used in a lot of different diets like keto, but it's also used in a lot of other diets. Uh, especially if you go vegan or vegetarian, because you use the jackfruit, which is the fruit on the inside, um, which we have a package that is already single serving size and ready to go. So you don't have to buy this 20 pound fruit, which is the common size, somewhere between 15 and 25. It's rare to see it over 25, but yeah. and extracting the fruit, extracting the flesh is very labor intensive. It's very time consuming. Plus, there's a huge skin you have to remove. There's fibers you have to remove. There's a center core. And then, of course, the seeds, which are edible, but you have to cook with them. But if you break it down, what you have in this package is a single serving size, an eight ounce. And uh, to answer your question, Philip, yes, these bricks at somewhere between a 20 and a 23, they're extremely sweet. Uh, and very tropical. When I always get the question about jackfruit, because not all of America's tried this fruit before. This fruit is very popular in Southeast Asia. It's very popular in South America. It's a huge fruit that grows in a tree. I, I sure hate to be in that tree where the jackfruit fell. Um, I'm sure there's stories about it on the internet there, but I haven't checked, but you can go ahead and do it on your own. Guess my um, fruit. Yes, this, the jackfruit for those, and a couple of you are shaking your head, this is the most difficult fruit to cut open. It actually, to usually cut it open, it takes about 15, 20 minutes because you're gonna have your stack of pods, which is the edible fruit, your stack of seeds, edible, but you have to cook, your stack of fibers, which you can use um, when you're making a pulled pork. Um, that's what the vegans, uh, vegetarians and vegans like to use the jackfruit. And you've probably seen this on the menu where the chefs are using the fibers and the pods they chop them up and they use them as a substitute for uh, taco meat or in a pulled pork sandwich because uh, the consistency is like pork. The flavor profile is very tropical. So it blends in well with spices uh, like pepper, uh, like pepper spices or barbecue sauce that simulates a meat alternative to pork for a pulled pork sandwich. So Jackfruit are available year round. This package is new, but it is a spring highlight as many tropical fruit are. And I'm gonna go over just a few more here as well. I suggest, as if I may, I, I suggest that everyone should experience cleaning a jackfruit. Um, and then once that's behind them, I recommend everyone buy those. Uh, if you wanna know how to clean a jackfruit, just go to the Melissa's YouTube, at Melissa's mm -hmm. Produce. And you can see a video from our chef, uh, I think it's Chef Tom, who uh, is one of our corporate chefs at Melissa's, who uh, extracts one and shows you exactly how to do it there. Or you can just go to our website. I think you can actually, if you go to our website and put in jackfruit, uh, the video it will be a click where you can launch into it as well. Yes, it is, uh, it is something fun to uh, do uh, jackfruit um, at, a, at your next party, graduation, anniversary. When you have a group of, uh, or if you have a big uh, family, this is the fruit to have. If you're a single person, this probably will be the way to go or if you have one or two people because a 25 pound jackfruit will give you at least uh, 18 pounds of edible fruit, pulp and seeds on the insides there. So anyway, all right, let's uh, continue on. I'm gonna talk about more of these tropical fruits. Uh, the most popular fruit in the United States is the almighty mango. However, during even though mangoes are available year round, the spring is the peak of the season. Why? Because there's so many different varieties that are available as to in the marketplace, in the, especially during the months of April, May, June, July. We have varieties like Tommy Atkins, Hayden, Keat, Kent's, the, the yellow, the all yellow ones, are called the um, altafos, which are called honey mangoes. We also import in the Indian ones called the alfonsos and kisars. Um, we also uh, uh, have a, a proprietary variety that we're really known for, uh, actually two. 
One is the Saperano mango, which comes out of Mexico. Mexico is really known for their mangoes. And you'll know it's a Saperano mango because they'll be on the label. But another one during the springtime are the tree ripened mangoes. You'll know it's a tree ripened mango because it will be on the label, okay? Labels are very important to know what type of variety you have because not all mangoes taste the same. However, um, one question that I always get about mangoes is how to cut them. And as you know, um, I love the mango. Before I worked at Melissa's, I had no idea about mangoes. And to know that they're the number one fruit in the United States, what, excuse me, the number one fruit in the world, but here in the United States, it's like number 15 or 16. It's, it's not as popular as it is everywhere else. So what does everybody else know that we don't? And it, it's a lot about education. Mangoes are uh, mainly imported into the United States. It wasn't until about 10 years ago that they actually started growing them in only two states that they still grow, but on a commercial basis, they're grown in California, and also uh, they do grow on a limited basis in uh, Florida. But most of the time, it is the number one imported fruit in the United States. Now, Robert, getting back, to, yes, these, these, these tree ripened ones are these are these the ones uh, that are grown on the shores of the Great Salton Sea. Okay, well, right now uh, we do grow them but they're on the border of Mexico and California. The tree ripened ones, they're in an area um, that is right on the border. And this is the thing that I was gonna get to is that the tree ripened ones and the keep mangoes, which you're referring to, um, are not cold water or hot water treated before they're brought into the United States. So the tree ripened ones, the Saperanos, and the green keats that Melissa offers um, do not have to go through that process. So they get to stay on the vine longer, meaning that um, they uh, get to become more sweet in flavor. The flesh is softer. And so you're gonna have a more enjoyable eating experience. And um, what I was showing you here is that when you cut a mango, you, you, you don't cut straight down the center like a peach. Um, to separate because it's not going to happen. You actually have to just go down each side. Um, and as your, your um, knife makes its way down, it will cut um, to separate between the flesh and the seed. Um, and for those who, I, I, I still run across people who've never had a mango before, you're really missing out on mangoes. And this is, again, the right time of the season because your mangoes, not only are there so many different varieties to choose from, um, it's also the peak of the season where in many cases, uh, the stores will sell them by the case. So they're not as expensive and you can buy them by the case. So uh, again, make sure you have uh, mangoes on your list. These are the ones that I recommend right now. Tree ripened ones, uh, the Saperano mangoes, um, and then later in the summertime are those green keep ones that are grown in uh, the Coachella Valley area by the Salton Sea. They're completely green. See, that's another thing about mangoes. People think that a mango has to be this red, orange, yellow, and green, or have no green on them. Color is, means nothing to, um, to a mango. Um, what really, what gives it away that a mango is ripe is smell and softness. And when it gives a little, then you know it's time to cut into it and enjoy. So, and never refrigerate your mangoes unless they become really soft. Um, because what happens is if you buy a mango at a store, put it in the refrigerator, it never truly ripens out. And I recommend that with almost every produce item. I think the only produce items that you don't have to do that with is berries, because berries are really highly perishable. But all other fruits, Keep on your counter until it ripens up. And it tells you when it's ripened up because the fruits are very fragrant. You would only put your fruit in the refrigerator, one, if you want it cold and chilled, or two, if it's so soft or so fragrant um, that you don't want it to go bad on your counter. And that's a, whole, that's a great tip for fruit across the boundary there. All right, next up, dragon fruit. Dragon fruit, is one of those most exciting fruits that you'll see in the marketplace. Believe it or not, it is actually the fruit of a cactus. Yes, it's a fruit of a cactus, a vining cactus. Um, if you live in the Florida area or Southern California, 
uh, we grow these in our backyard now because uh, the cactus roots grow so well and you have to have a lot of room for it to vine. You can't just have it grow unless you know how to um, trellis it because this is a vining cactus. It's not a regular cactus, it just grows like this. It, it shoots out and whatnot. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, item to grow. It's very easy because it's drought tolerant. But let me tell you about dragon fruit. There's three different major varieties of dragon fruit. So this is the one you see the most common. It's probably visually one of the coolest looking fruits you'll ever see. There's the white flesh variety. Now the white flesh variety is mild in flavor. It bricks is low on a refractometer and it's very much how I describe it as a very muted flavored kiwi. What's the edible part is the white and little black seeds. The seeds you won't even, they're, they're like raspberry seeds. You won't, they're not crunchy or anything like that. Okay. The only, the, the, the way you'll know that you have a um, white dragon fruit is the label because the red dragon fruit has a label that says red dragon fruit. They look pretty much the same on the outside. So it's very key that you look at the, the um, sticker. Now, the red dragon fruit, I recommend, especially if you like a sweeter tasting fruit, these bricks about uh, uh, four degrees more than that of a, a white fleshed variety. And so these are a, a little bit sweeter, but now we actually have a third variety of dragon fruit. That's the yellow dragon fruit. It actually, well, it looks kind of greenish, but it starts to turn yellow. It cuts white. The seeds are a little bit bigger, but just like the regular dragon fruit, you really don't, you won't know that they're seeds. However, this variety is the one you want. These are from Ecuador um, and they're white fleshed and they bricks like a 22 to 24 in a refractometer. Unlike the red flesh variety that bricks is at about a 14. Unlike the white variety that bricks is at about a 12, maybe a 10 and whatnot. Um, and they're very smooth and delicious. They're very easy uh, to remove. Once you cut it in half, um, like here, uh, you could just basically, the fruit just pulls out a part. This is your edible part. This is not. And uh, so they're very easy to work with. Unlike a prickly pear, uh, a cactus pear is very different. This fruit does not, is, is nothing like a cactus fruit pear. Um, so most people refer to this as a tropical fruit because it's so different from a succulent cactus fruit like the prickly pear. All right, so dragon fruit. I hope the dragon fruit is now on your list. Uh, next up, Let's uh, talk about the kumquat. The kumquat's one of the very few citrus specialty varieties that are available to us in the marketplace. I'm gonna show you a trick. Now the kumquat is an entirely edible fruit, um, but I'm gonna show you how to ripen it up really fast. A lot of people like to take the kumquats and put them in the fridge and that's fine. I always recommend to put them on the counter and when they start becoming very fragrant, then put them into the fridge. But this is the way you should um, shock, you need to shock a uh, kumquat before, to really enjoy it because they're enjoyed whole. In many cases, the um, chefs, they only use the peel and uh, they don't use the flesh, the, um, the, um, the flesh on the inside. The flesh on the inside is super sour. So you need to actually, this is how you ripen them up. You take them, and what you're doing is you're actually breaking the skin. So the, the sweetness and the tart sourness um, are consistently um, working throughout the whole fruit. So if you cut it and put it into a salad or make a jam or something like that, um, the, the whole tart and sweetness is um, distributed evenly in the fruit. So it's actually really fun to get the kids involved in regards to this. It's the kids that really like these because they're so much into sour and tartness now but with sweetness as well. And they're very versatile. The season, although starts in December, it actually goes until July. So the springtime is actually the peak of the season for these fruits. 
Okay. I remember the discovering contract. those. I remember discovering those as a child. And, and, and once I learned that you just pop them into your mouth, you know, cause you know, peeling, peeling, peeling citrus can be, can be a chore. Just pop them into your mouth like berries and, you know, go to town. Wonderful. Right. Right. All right. Wow. I'm going to have to go through this a little bit faster. I'm, I guess I'm going a little slow there, Philip. It's, it's I'm, okay. I'm gonna, we're we're gonna, all happy I'm gonna, here, I'm sure. I'm going to speed up a little bit more there. Um, and now let's talk about this fruit. Uh, Phil had mentioned there's going to be three lucky winners in the social media contest um, over the next couple of days. Um, and this welcome the newest fruit and the rarest fruit in the United States, the pink pineapple. Now, I know what you're looking at this and Philip mentioned it earlier. And I wanted to save it during my presentation. Why isn't there a top? The reason why there isn't a top is because the grower chops them off and replants them. Okay, they're grown in Costa Rica, but what's what makes the pink pineapple so unique? Well, it literally is pink on the inside, but it really comes down to flavor pro profile. And pineapples are one of my favorite fruits uh, out there. They're so delicious. Um, the neat thing about these pink pineapple, how if you're familiar, uh, I assume most of you are familiar with the gold pineapple, the yellow pineapple, the typical pineapple that you buy. Those tend to be sweet, but they also tend to be very tart, uh, like, a, like a strong citrus acid in there. And for people who have very sensitive gums, uh, they kind of tend to, ways to stay away from some of the stronger acidic acid type fruits like the pineapple. However, this is the sweetest of all pineapple. There is a ton more sweetness than there is acid. In fact, the acid is very low. And uh, these bricks, amazingly, somewhere between a 20 and a 25. So they're super sweet. The acidity levels probably 25% than that of a regular one. So for those who always uh, not enjoyed pineapple because of their acid, you can enjoy this pineapple. And like I said, it's rare. It, is so rare. We had actually um, helped uh, introduce it into the United States back in November of 2020, that this fruit is so hard to find in your local produce department that you can only find it online. And they are very pricey, but um, actually it's our number one selling item online because they're just really hard to find. Only a few stores throughout the United States and major, major metropolitan areas are starting to sell them. But again, I warn you, they're very pricey. But uh, with Mother's Day coming up there, who wouldn't like to serve a pink pineapple um, on, a, on, a, on a fruit, on a pineapple upside down cake used in a drink or just on your fruit platter for Mother's Day? Mom's worth it. So go for it. And, I, and uh, three of you guys are going to win. So make sure you post about some of the exciting things uh, we talk about today. Okay, moving on. Let's talk to vegetables. I'm going to go in a little bit faster here because um, Robert. Before you go on, there. I have a quick, quick question about how the pink oh, sure. arrived at. Is the is the pink naturally occurring, or is it has been has it been hybridized? It has been hybridized. They took a lipopene, which is a red colored fruit like a tomato, and crossed it with the pineapple. So that gives it its pink uh, flavor profile. But because of the growing conditions and the cross hybridization, they discovered that the low acidity, that the, these pineapples have a very low acidity and a much sweeter flavor profile. They do keep them on longer on the plant, giving them their higher sweetness content because it's hard to introduce a fruit if the difference was only the color. It's the flavor uh, that you're really paying for and the color is just an extra bonus. Right, thank you. Okay, all right. So let's zip through some vegetables. I know some vegetables that really come to mind during the springtime that are not so familiar and are harder to find in the marketplace like ramps, which are wild leeks, or fava beans, or English peas, the only time of the year that you can actually get peas that are in the pod, unlike your common green pea that is potted and ready to go. There's a big taste difference between what you get in a can or frozen versus an English pea, which is a potted pea for some of you foodies out there, you really know the difference. Of course, you have spring onions, you have green garlic and fiddlehead fern. 
Um, these are some of the things that probably comes to mind when you think spring. Um, but I wanna talk to you about some of the ones that also peak during the season. They have a great flavor profile. They're less expensive in the store um, and they become very plentiful in the marketplace. So let's start with tomatoes. Now tomatoes botanically is a fruit in the eyes of the Supreme Court, it's actually a vegetable, it's a tax issue. I don't wanna talk about it, but believe it or not, the tomato industry back in the seventies uh, um, got the judge to change it to a vegetable for tax purposes. But as you all know, uh, it has seeds botanically, it's a fruit. I'm not gonna get into the politics of things, but I wanna talk about <laughs> springtime is a great time as we lead into the peak of the season for tomatoes. To, the, to peak, the peak season for tomatoes is always summer. Many of you grow them in your backyard. This is, this is like the fruit of the fruit. This is one of the few crops I grow in my backyard uh, because I love tomatoes so much. Um, and look at these tomatoes. For springtime, they're gorgeous, they're beautiful, and they're flavorful. Not only are there so many different varieties, different colors and stuff, there's a story behind each one, but also in your cherry and uh, the cherry and teardrop shapes, uh, we have these beautiful um, cherry tomatoes in all different colors, red, yellow, orange, uh, darker purple, black, even brown colored ones. Again, there's a story to be told in every clamshell or every package and tomato that you see in the produce department um, about these tomatoes there. So it gets me excited to see already in the springtime, these, these bountiful um, fruits becoming really plentiful and available. And of course, the price coming down, unlike the winter time, when the winter time, tomatoes, they're not as colorful, they're not as bright or hue and color. Uh, and then they're a lot more expensive. So uh, heirloom, it's a help heirloom on your wallet. Tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes are, are a, a, a meal in themselves. Um, slice one up, some blue, some chunky blue cheese dressing, and you've got a meal. It's just definitely it's a it's 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 a sinful experience. It's, <laughs> it's incredible. Yes. Next up for spring, leeks. And I want to talk about this humbled vegetable that is really prevalent and well-known in Europe for cooking. Unlike here in the United States, some people don't even know about them. They look at this and say, someone left their green onions. Uh, they forgot about their green onions growing in their backyard. Uh, they may look at that appearance, but they're so different. This is a very refined onion. Um, and I wanna go through a couple of things because uh, the main thing is the education on how to do leeks, okay? So first of all, what is the edible part? Some people think the whole thing's edible and you just cut it. No, the edible part is the part before the greens. So this is the edible part. So you'll find leeks in its whole entirety like this, okay? You'll find leeks with just the tops. We call them, um, so I'm just, I don't have it with me but you'll be able to find them just with the tops. They're called trimmed leeks. You'll also find leeks already cleaned and sliced. Now, this is the thing about leeks that a lot of people are confused about is how to clean a leek. So leeks typically, like most fruits and vegetables, you wash, your fruits and, you wash them, obviously, and then you cut them and you, you can eat them raw if they're fruit. And if they're a vegetable, in some cases you can eat them raw, but then of course you wash them and then you cook, cut and put in. The thing about leeks is they're grown in loomy soils, kind of a sandy like soil. And the thing is, is when it grows, the, the, the sandy soil gets trapped inside this vegetable. So you want to actually cut the edible part and then wash it, okay? And that's where, most of the problems occur because when people cook with leeks and they don't know that, and then you get this little, and you're eating a meal and you get this little granule of sand or grit when you're eating, they're gonna say, oh, those, those leeks. I'm never gonna work with leeks again. I couldn't get all the sand out. It's because they washed it and then cut it and threw it in. 
but cut it, then wash it, and then cook with them. So for those who've never tried leeks, this is your chance. Uh, think of it as a very refined onion, not a overgrown green onion. And I think you're gonna step up your cooking that much more the next time you cook with them. Yeah. Go to melissas.com and you will you'll see a ton of recipes for leeks and the mini recipe and the mini fruits and, and vegetables that I'm gonna talk about as well. I would say shallots, shallots are likewise revelatory. Um, you know, that it's a whole other, it's a whole other aspect of onion-dom, if you will. Yeah, I basically have replaced many of their onion recipes with shallots or in leeks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's as you get more of a, as a refined cook. I'm, I am the chef at home. I love to eat as I described at the beginning. So, uh, you know, I'm partial to these and I, I have accessibility. It's, it's yeah. called legal embezzlement. So I get to take <laughs> these stuff, this stuff home all the time and cook with it. I so, call it anyway. an occupational hazard. Okay, or that, <laughs> okay. So yes, the artichoke. There's nothing that really says spring, especially in California or availability throughout most of the United States is the artichoke because artichokes are only grown in California here in the States there. Um, very few are able to produce and grow them um, in their home gardens. It is possible, but on a commercial basis, Casterville, Monterey, that area, that is the home of the almighty artichoke. Now, I want to talk about a couple of artichoke options that you have out there, because for the average American, this is a difficult vegetable. Well, actually, it's a flower. If you actually kept it on the vine a little longer, it will actually turn into a purple flower. At that case, you can't eat it. So pull them when they get to this level before they open up and turn into a big, beautiful purple flower. Okay, now the artichoke, what makes it so difficult is how to cook it um, or uh, the application where you enjoy the petals after it's cooked and you eat off, you don't eat the whole petal, you eat part of it and you scrape it off in your teeth, in your mouth and enjoy the experience. And then of course, as you peel the petals of this flower and make it into the, the, the gold pot that is contained within the heart of an artichoke. So that's one thing that people just aren't familiar with. But I wanna show you another variety of artichoke. And these are baby artichokes. Now, the crown, which is the big artichoke, is the top part that's cut off and enjoyed. But these, these little baby artichokes grow all the way around it. About 25 years ago, believe it or not, the baby artichoke in the United States was looked upon as a dud. And so there was no market for baby artichokes in the United States, very rare, only the chefs did them. So they just threw them all away. But for those who are in Europe and other parts of the country where uh, in Europe, especially uh, Italy, France, Spain and whatnot, baby artichokes are, are easier to cook and they're almost entirely edible. And let me explain that. So baby artichokes, all you have to do is peel off a couple of the petals, the rough ones, cut it in half, cut off the stem and cut off the thorny top. And what you have is an entirely edible uh, vegetable. You can have them, you can quarter them, and then you can, make a, you can add them into a pasta after the cook, but you do have to steam and cook them. You don't eat them raw, obviously. And um, so, you know, what we didn't know 25 years ago, we finally know. And you'll find baby artichokes in produce departments across the country as well, right next to the other artichokes. Now, we even made it even easier. There's a third option to enjoy artichokes. Um, and that is, uh, we already have them steamed and ready to go. You can buy them in a package. For those who know Melissa's products well, we have many products like this, like fava beans. We have beets steamed and ready to go. We have chestnuts, lentils, six bean medley. Uh, we do uh, even uh, chickpeas and whatnot. We have yellow or beets as well. 
Yes. And um, so in other words, if this is too difficult for you, we have this third option, which is really easy, especially if you're making something on the fly, because when you steam an artichoke like this, it's going to take you about 30, 40 minutes in a steamer. When you have the baby artichoke, it's going to take you about 20 minutes in the steamer, or you can just have it ready to go in this package. It's a cryo vac vac package. There is no preservative in here. Uh, so it's nothing like a jarred or can, which is usually in a heavy preservative of an olive oil. So you have more of the flavor and uh, the texture that comes along with artichokes. So look for that in your local produce department. There. Robert, before we go on, we got a couple of, a couple of notes in the chat. Uh, um, sure. Patricia, artichokes in the Instant Pot, 10 minutes. Yes, a steamer or an Instant Pot has really revolutionized shorter cooking time. Um, so obviously that's a better, that's, that is a fast method, even like other technologies like the Thermomix is another great uh, tool to have to shorten the cooking time of a lot of different root vegetables and vegetables like this. Mm -hmm. But really, I think the confusion really comes in is how you prep it, cook it, and what is the edible part? Because there are, as you know, on artichokes, you, you eat the, the meat that is on the leaf. You don't eat the whole leaf. You don't eat the tops of the thorn. And then on the inside, right before the um, heart is this like fuzziness and you don't eat that part as well. The stems, believe it or not, I'm gonna tell you this now, are completely edible. Most people don't know that, but they are. So yeah. next time you get an artichoke and you buy an artichoke and you're buying it by the pound, eat it, just steam it cook it and enjoy it. And it almost, the stem actually tastes like the heart. In the center area is the heart. It's just the heart comes to an end in the center core of the flower. Yeah. There we go. And, and a bit of a callback, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry put in a good word for Cipollini onions. Well, thank you, Jerry, because that segues my, uh, my spring, my spring uh, vegetables that you must eat at this time and enjoy. So let's talk about some sweet onions. Now, this is the time of the year that you're gonna get so many different varieties of sweet onions. Onions like Bedelia, Walla Walla. There's gonna be so many different varieties available to us in the marketplace, it's ridiculous. Um, and it's exciting too. And I'm gonna tell you the three top sweet onion varieties that you can find in your local produce department. Cipollini onions is one of them. This is the true Italian sweet onion. They're smaller onions, super sweet. And those who are in Europe, this is like the leek of, 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 of Europe. This is the onion of Europe. These are very common, not only in Italy, but most of Europe. And uh, they're super sweet. They're available year round. But like I said, sweet onions peak during um, the spring and, and summer months as well. Another, thank you, Jerry. Another variety of onion to look forward to come out of Hatch, New Mexico. Hatch is known for their uh, green peppers that only become the Hatch uh, chili peppers that are only available during the months of August and September, but that's not until summer. But come May, we now have these, this will be like our fourth year that we have these Hatch sweet onions. This is the crop they plant before they plant the chilies um the hatched chilies so again it's a very short season it's only going to be may and part of june but look for them or go to melissa's.com and find out where they're going to become available a third and final sweet onion and this is the cool thing like the chipotle onions the perfect sweet onion we call it the perfect sweet onion because one it's a sweet onion you can enjoy year round it's perfect because it's a sweet onion it's a great um alternative to any of your other onions if you're gonna have a shorter cooking time, okay, because a traditional onion like a yellow, a yellow onion or white onion, those are good boiling onions, a long cooking onion to get a more savory flavor. But in cooking, especially during the springtime, a lot of chefs and home cooks like to use the sweet onions when they are in, in season. So remember the perfect sweet onion and the chipolini onions available year round. But look for those highlighted uh, sweet onions that are available to us during the springtime. 
Onions are just a staple ingredient used in most uh, uh, everyday cooking, you know, and there's so many different varieties and not all taste the same. Like the average and most common is the yellow onion, but it, it, these sweet onions trump any type of yellow onion or white onion. And in many cases, red onions. Red onions do have a little bit more sweetness, but they do have a different application um, versus your traditional onion. But in this case, during the springtime, I only use sweet onions instead of yellow onions when I do a lot of cooking because I mainly cook, cook, cook on the grill out on the barbecue most of the time of all the spring and summertime because of the great weather. All right, next up, thank you, Jerry. Next up, um, spring, springtime, it's rhubarb time. Even though rhubarb, because of consumer demand, is available about 10 months of the year, springtime is rhubarb time. One, it's, it's easier to find in your local produce department or at your farmer's market. Two, it's more flavorful during this time because of the plentifulness. And three, you're gonna be, it's not as expensive. If you bought rhubarb around Christmas time, it is extremely expensive. And only people who are foodies are gonna buy rhubarb because it's so expensive. But during this time, in the spring and summertime months, when we get into the domestic crop, which is mainly uh, Washington, and then as we make our way into the spring and summer, it's Oregon, and then California is the late season time, that's when you're going to find rhubarb. It, uh, most people think it's actually a, they think it's a red celery. It's definitely not celery. <laughs> it's application in desserts, in the famous rhubarb pie. Um, and, and if you just Google or go to melissas.com, all the recipes that you can do, these pair so well with other fruits um, when you're making tarts or sweets, um, strawberries. It's a natural to go with strawberries. Um, rhubarb was, it has been one of those dying vegetables because it was one of those that believe it, it's a vegetable. It's not a fruit just because it's used in pies. It's a very a tart experience. So when you're cooking with it, if you use it straight up, you do have to use sugar, but there's something so unique about the rhubarb. I know Jeannie who's on right now will agree with me. Uh, the rhubarb is something really special, and it's very, uh, very much a spring vegetable. So you're right, suggesting more. You're suggesting yes. we. You're suggesting we refrain from throwing it on the rhubarb barbecue. Uh, well, you can uh, rhubarb barbecue it. You can grill it, and then uh, uh, use it like on ice cream or something like that. So it sounds like Philip, you have worked with these before. I have. But like yeah. I said. You have to put it with something really sweet because it's a very tart stock uh, vegetable, though used mainly used as a right. fruit in desserts. All right, just a couple more things and then we'll get to some of the questions. Spring is all about cucumbers. Cucumbers are very plentiful, not only year round, but really during the spring and summer times because it's a domestic crop. This particular variety is my favorite and the easiest because it's a mini cucumber. Some refer to it as a baby cucumber. All you do, like most produce, wash it, cut it, you're ready to go. You don't have to skin it. It doesn't have uh, wax on it or anything like that. So mini cucumbers, cucumbers, just make a salad with it. Um, right now there's a big thing with cucumbers and celery and juicing and stuff like that. Um, but I like making it as a salad alternative where I just cut the cucumbers, Sprinkle some salt, a little spice on there, a little vinaigrette, a cucumber salad. Spring is all about cucumbers. And then finally, to end my conversation, even though I can go on and on, I've got like 1,500 stories, but I know you guys have lives. But the final <laughs> thing to look forward to during spring, because of um, it's not only available conventionally and organically like the cucumbers, but Brussels sprouts. I love Brussels sprouts. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I'm going to age myself, Brussels sprouts was a punishment. But believe it or not, the kids, the, millennium, the millennials, um, uh, the Zoomers, uh, Generation Z, they love Brussels sprouts. I love Brussels sprouts. They pair so well with nuts, dried cranberries, a little bacon in there. Uh, but this is the time. You'll uh, also be able to find it as we get later in the season on the stock, which is the best way to enjoy them. 
but typically you can find them most conventionally. Um, you can also find them purple too, which is a natural color, but most common than not, Brussels sprouts are something that um, you'll find green. You can, you can cook them, especially with the smaller ones right now in the springtime, um, you can cook them whole, you don't have to cut them. As we make our way into the summertime, they get much larger where you'll have to cut them. I always refer to them as little balls of cabbage um, and the, the texture, the flavor profiles, a little salt and pepper, a little olive oil drizzled on top. A little goes a long way. You don't have to add the bacon. Bacon helps or nuts and anything like that. It can but never hurt. Truly, one of my delicious vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, when I when I was working in opera, people would always say, "Philip, what's your favorite opera?" And when they learned that I work in cocktails and spirits through the cocktail collection, uh, one of our divisions, they say, "What's your favorite cocktail?" My standard response has always always has been and remains as if, meaning as if I would limit myself. Um, but we have a question from the floor about okay. your favorite or what are your favorites when it comes to fruits and vegetables? Okay, right now it's pixie tangerines without a doubt. Um, also the Harry's berries. Um, but my other favorite fruits are mangosteens. If you've ever tried a mangosteen, um, most people in the, in the world believe the mangosteen is the best tasting fruit in, you know, in the world, not just in uh, the United States, though they're very hard to come by. Mangosteens are very difficult to find, but Melissa's.com, not a problem when they are in season. They're in season about nine, 10 months of the year. Um, I also like Korean pears, Korean pears, um, which we call butterscotch pears. They are an air, Asian pear variety. They're in the shape of an apple. They're golden color. Um, they are seasonal. They're only available from November until about March. So the season just ended, but it's something to look forward to. Um, the closest substitute to that is an Asian pear, but there's something really special about the butterscotch pears. Um, also, I'm, I'm a fan of berries. Everything berries. Berries are highly nutritious as well. I don't discriminate. I like blueberries, raspberries, blackberries. Um, actually, up here in my cabin, blackberries grow wild. So I'm very partial to blackberries as well. But uh, give me a great strawberry and I am happy. So those Harry's Berry strawberries, which you have to take advantage during the springtime, are available. Um, they've been a little bit limited because of the cooler temperatures and whatnot um, lately, but you'll start seeing them in the stores. Just ask, ask about them. And then, of course, on the vegetable side, you guys already know that tomatoes are like my favorite in the eyes of spring pork vegetable, but um, botanically they are a fruit. Um, and I, I am partial to uh, Brussels sprouts as well as I was just talking about, but um, the almighty artichoke, I don't think there's anything more elegant and fun to enjoy in a meal, whether it's a pasta or, or just simply just enjoying one petal at a time. Uh, I don't think anything beats an artichoke. Yeah, with some lemon butter, mm. yeah, or stuffed. If, if you wanna learn how to stuff an artichoke, uh, uh, go to our YouTube channel, Eats Drinks TV, Eats Drinks TV, and look up Culinary Quickies. Uh, one of our early episodes, Chef Tracy Mitchell stuffs an artichoke uh, with breadcrumbs and Italian cheeses and I think shrimp and sausage. I'm not sure, but uh, that that is as, as gloriously decadent as it sounds. Um, so mm -hmm. we're going to open up the floor to some Q&A. If you'd like to ask, ask or pose a question. Uh, to Robert uh, or me, um, I invite, I encourage you to unmute, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Mindy. Anyone? Cat, cat, Hi. Cat's got your tongues? I got, I, I have a question about, um, are there different varieties of Brussels sprouts? Yes. Uh, now, most commonly the green, the green oh, Brussels sprout is the most common. However, you'll also find in the marketplace during this time, purple Brussels sprouts. The purple Brussels sprouts, it's very cool. They retain their color because a lot of times colorful vegetables, when you cook with them, they lose their color. The purple Brussels sprouts do not lose their color. Um, they have a milder flavor. So if you want a stronger Brussels sprout flavor, go with the green ones. 
And also another thing about the Brussels sprouts, you'll also find during the spring and summer times, we offer the baby Brussels sprouts. That means uh, it's packaged baby Brussels sprouts. You, do ne you never have to cut them open. I love eating Brussels sprouts uh, whole, but especially during the summertime, they get really large about the size of a golf ball. And then I end up having to cut them uh, before cooking with them. Anyone else? Robert, what, how did the, um, the yellow dragon fruits, how, how did they come about and why are they so much sweeter than the, the other two varieties? Okay, so good question there, Christina. The check is in the mail. <laughs> um, so the pink dragon fruit, this is a South, this is a Southeast Asian variety, okay? Um, and they have these what are called bracts. Okay, now the, the, the dragon fruit that are pink in, from Mexico, Central America and South America, they don't have these bracts on them. They call them pataya. That's not the variety that we're growing. Um, even though they grow in Vietnam, that's where we get majority of the dragon fruit. But now in the springtime, we now get them from Florida and Nicaragua. Soon the California season will start and we, we do this variety only pink, okay? However, the yellow dragon fruit, it is only grown in central California and specifically in Ecuador. And this is the sweetest of all the different varieties. It looks a little different, but it is a binding cactus. It's harder to find, but it's well worth it, especially if you want a sweet um, dragon fruit experience go with the yellow dragon fruit. Let's see. Who else? Tasha? I see. Yeah, I have, I have a question on uh, pickling. I, I do some. Tasha, can you hear us? Some pickling or does it, does it can, matter? Can you, can you restart your question? You froze for a moment. Sure. I have a question on pickling. I do quick quick pickling <laughs> with with different things like red onions and carrots and cucumbers. And Robert, do you recommend using the smaller pickles or the smaller cucumbers for pickling or does it matter? No, it, it, I think in a flavor profile, it does matter. The particular cucumber you want, it's called Kirby. It has a, it's smaller in size. It has a thick skin and um, they take a little bit longer to pickle but they have the crunch. If you use like the mini cucumber, these will pickle like really fast, but they won't have the crunch. This, uh, the, the baby cucumber has a really thin skin. So you just won't get the crunch. Go for what they call pickling cucumbers or Kirby cucumbers when you do a pickle. All right. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you. We have a couple of raised hands here. Uh, Adam Bell, Adam. Yeah, hey, uh, Robert, I was curious about the baby Brussels sprouts. I hate to go back to the Brussels sprouts again, but uh, I was curious, you were mentioning before that you don't have to cut the Brussels sprouts when you cook the baby Brussels sprouts, but do you still have to cut the stems off? Are there, I assume there are stems. Well, this is the thing. If, if you get them under the Melissa label, the Melissa's package, um, it's already stemmed. So you just gotta make sure you wash it off good. You know, right. it may show a, a scar or a browning. Um, you can cut them, but the thing is, if you cut too far in the stem, it's gonna start, it, the, the Brussels sprout's gonna fall apart. And one thing that I like about the Brussels sprout is eating them whole. So basically what I'm trying to say is, uh, Adam, is if you buy the Melissa's package, the whole completely thing is edible. Sometimes other companies may leave a little bit of stem on. It's still edible but you'll notice that the stem is very much oxidized, you know, kind of shrivels and browns up. So a lot of people just cut that off. But usually when you buy Brussels sprouts, the whole thing is edible, okay? Okay, and what, and what, about, the, and what about the cooking times? I mean, if you're gonna roast them, which is what I normally do, I usually it's about 30 minutes with the regular ones. Are they less with babies? Yes, good, good point. I didn't mention that, Adam. When you uh, work with the babies, uh, because of the size, it's gonna take half the amount of time uh, if you steam, boil, or microwave, it's half the time 
because of the size. And you know, the, the Brussels sprouts are really dense. So if you cut a large Brussels sprout into quarters, it's about the same cooking time as a baby Brussels sprout. But like, again, I said, I love eating them whole. So, you know, saute is probably my favorite way to have them, a little saute and olive oil, salt and pepper. Doesn't take much to enjoy these babies. And it's not a punishment. <laughs> Adam, thank you very much. Daryl, yeah. Daryl, your hand is raised. Yes, I wanted to know about the pink pineapples. Is the acid content actually lower or is it a perception because the sugar, the sugar is... The acidity is measured. It is significantly lower. Um, and that's just because of the growing conditions and the cross hybridization that they were, the, um, that um, the grower was specifically looking for a lot less acidic variety um, when they were growing these pineapples because people, a lot of people have a, a gum issue or they don't, they try to stay away from high citric acid because of medication and whatnot. And this is if you like sweet. If you don't like sweet pineapples, this isn't the pineapple for you. They're extremely juicy as well. Okay, I was just curious because a lot of times you see tomatoes uh, described as being low acid, but they're not really low acid. They just have low. They just have higher sugar, which changes your taste perception. Uh, good point, Daryl. There, um, yeah, the, the pink pineapples do have a lower acidity, 25% that of a typical pineapple. No, well, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any more questions? Additional questions? Okay, there being none, uh, uh, we, we are fortunate, you know, we always pitch what's coming up uh, uh, soon in our programming. We're fortunate enough to have our next morning call guest with us, uh, uh, Chef Christina Xenos, um, uh, author of Opa, the Healthy Greek, the Healthy Greek Cookbook, uh, also star of uh, Each Drinks TV's Complete Greek, uh, happens to be on the call this morning. Christina, would you mind unmuting yourself and telling us what we can look forward to? Yeah, next week we're going to make two of my favorite recipes. Uh, one is spanakorizo, so it's a uh, it's a spinach rice, but in my version, I also add the 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 baby tomatoes that Robert was talking about. So it gives it an extra punch of acidity and flavor. So um, in Greece, traditionally, you would put like tomato paste or tomato sauce in it, but why not use fresh tomatoes, especially those baby tomatoes when they're available. And then we're gonna make um, avgalemono soup with chicken. So avgalemono is a Greek sauce, the egg lemon sauce, and that's applied to a lot of dishes in Greek cuisine, but the most famous is the chicken and rice soup that you fold this avgalemono sauce into. And I'm gonna teach you how to do that so you won't curdle your eggs and you'll have, it's, it, we call it Greek penicillin because anytime we're sick, that's what our grandmothers always made us. So it's gonna it's be really Greek, fun. Your Greek chicken soup. Yeah, my Greek chicken soup. So yeah, it'll what be is, super fun. How do you, how does one say schmaltz in Greek? <laughs> I don't know. Don't know. We'll, we'll have, have to look that one up. Do the yeah, Google. we don't really have a tradition of schmaltz, so. <laughs> Alex is Google. yelling at me because I'm talking All right, to you. all right, very good. And that that is the 24th, correct? Yeah, the, that's the 24th. Now on May 1st, we'll have with us Chef Hari Pulapaka uh, uh, from Southeast Florida, Chef, uh, Chef Harry Pulapaka is uh, an extraordinary individual. Uh, Chef Harry Pulapaka, uh, uh, PhD. He's also a tenured uh, professor of math uh, at Stetson University. He owns Crest Restaurant. Crest Restaurant, he is an author. His latest book is titled uh, Dreaming in Spice. Um, so that'll be a very special Saturday morning, morning call and lots more great stuff coming up, including virtual wine tastings. I know it, it sounds a little, that's a little depressing, virtual anything, wine or spirits or food, uh, but plenty, plenty of great virtual wine tastings and spirits tastings and cocktail seminars. You know, the usual, the usual mix from us, uh, but alas, purely online at the moment. But of course, we're doing much of it. We're preserving much of it for posterity and producing lots of uh, 
food, drink, and uh, spirits podcasts and web series uh, at Eats Drinks TV on YouTube. So we invite you to go there, encourage you to go there and subscribe so that you know what's coming up as it comes up. Um, all of you get our newsletter. So watch that newsletter coming to you on an at least weekly basis. Sign up for all that we're doing. Um, again, this social media contest, uh, we will follow up via email so that everyone has it in their inbox. All of the, 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 the handles and hashtags, there are four of them we'd like you to use uh, uh, to qualify. And uh, three of you uh, will we'll, we'll get a, a Del Monte Pink Glow Pineapple, courtesy Melissa's Produce, on your front porch or stoop. Uh, Robert, any final words? Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to come aboard and oh, uh, present today. I hope uh, everybody has learned a little bit more about produce and have been excited to now make your way to the local produce department or farmer's market and eat more fruits and vegetables in your everyday diet. Very good. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. This will become available online in time again at Eat Strings TV on YouTube. Uh, thank you all for joining us, Robert. Thank you. And the center thanks you uh, for the support shown by Melissa's Produce. Thank you all. Signing off. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Went well? Oh, it went very well. It could not have gone more well. All right. Sorry about the time there. I had to, I had to press the accelerator when I got the vegetables there. I, uh, when you're on a wild ride, you know, don't get off. All right. Just well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that uh, you, with you and Tracy tuned in that uh, uh, I might see a very spring uh, request coming up in the oh, week. Oh, yes, huh? you will. We're going to be, in <laughs> fact, we'll be, we'll be ramping it up. Okay, the ramp. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And of course, we're developing the new series, Cook What? But uh, you'll know more about that as it occurs because we're going to integrate that with what's coming up seasonally. So, well, thanks, okay. Philip. You take care. Bye, Robert. Thank you. you. Enjoy your weekend. Bye, all. See you soon. Bye.